rather than focusing on any singular part of the industry, not you know, rather than focusing, say, on retail or consumers or on investment trends, we cast the net completely wide to capture any data we could from any source, um, feed it into our system, and start using that to identify where both the connective tissue was within these data sets, mm -hmm. as well as what the broader story we were seeing emerging was. We've just done uh, what we believe to be the most comprehensive assessment of global demand for cannabis in the world today. There are over 260 million, at least semi-regular cannabis consumers around the world who are collectively spending over $350 billion each year on cannabis. That does not include um, all of the medical applications and, yeah. and the, the emerging kind of therapeutic uses, um, nor does it include any of the industrial applications that are emerging with activation of legal industrial hemp. Wow. Um, I believe that the legalization of cannabis is going to be um, arguably the most consequential social change of our, of our generation. We're now looking at over 60 countries um, just in a five-year window. Um, so the pace is accelerating dramatically and the reason why it's moving so quickly is because yeah. the science is affirming it. Cannabis is largely or increasingly being seen as, as acceptable, if not better than alcohol. And that's part of the reason why companies like Constellation Brands, one of the world's largest cannabis com uh, alcohol companies, uh, just spent $4 billion investing in a Canadian licensed operator. They, they see the writing on the wall. We use the public facing reports that we, we release as a way to signal to the market some of the major issues that we're thinking about. So the, the data that we make available through Equia, which is our, our data platform, maybe the, the simple way to think about it, it's like Bloomberg for the cannabis industry, mm -hmm. houses the, not just the reports that we produce, but the data underlying the reports. If you want to go in and explore the data yourself, you can certainly do that. Through that, we developed nine cannabis consumer archetypes, profiles of cannabis consumers that are not just defined based on what they consume and how they consume, but based on all of these other lifestyle attributes as well. We would all do well to find more joy in ourselves and spark joy in each other. And I think that seems to be one of the motivate or driving commitments that's pushing a lot of people in this space. Someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We're on site at the beautiful New West Summit, the Cannabis Tech Conference. We are now going to be speaking with John Kagia. Hi, John. How's it going? Thank you so much for coming on the show. The pleasure's mine. Thank you for having me. I'm so pumped for this conversation. <laughs> for those who don't know John's background, he's Chief Knowledge Officer at New Frontier Data, and he's one of the first analysts to focus exclusively on legal cannabis. All right. John, how, who are you? How did you even get interested in this field? So uh, I'll tell you, I never in a million years thought I would be working in cannabis. Um, I'm a professionally trained market analyst. I got my master's degrees in uh, business and in marketing research. And I built my career working uh, generally for small market research agencies that were working for very large generally very conservative organizations, the Microsofts, IBMs, Northrop Drummonds of the world. Um, and we would work with these companies to help them kind of address and deal with, respond to major strategic operational challenges, how to build new products that are going to be serving the global marketplace. In late 2011, as we were watching the run-up to Colorado's ballotish initiative, as we're getting the signatures ready and trying to get the uh, vote for legalization on, on the ballot, I began paying attention to it because, candidly, I never thought cannabis was going to be legal in my lifetime. Mm. And just out of personal interest, I'm an information junkie, um, I started digging into some of the early numbers that we were seeing uh, uh, in Colorado around support, and it became apparent to me that there was a very good chance that this was going to pass, and that nobody was paying attention to it. And there was certainly nobody providing the kind of market research that we had been providing to you know, these world-class organizations, the kind of market research that you find in every other sector of the economy, in what seemed to be an e a sector of the economy that was about to emerge. So I proposed to my employers at the time that maybe this is something that we should look at. And, you know, we worked in Washington, D.C. We had many government clients, and like, yeah, not, not yet. Um, so our compromise was that it becomes a personal uh, pet project 
Um, I would report out every three to six months what we were finding, and we would make a go, go, no, go, go, no go decision on whether or not to enter this space. Well, fast forward four years, and every time I presented, they'd be like, oh, this is amazing. By that point, Colorado's measure had passed, Washington legalized, Washington, D.C. had legalized. Uh, but with every presentation, they're like, this is amazing, but we're not quite ready yet. We're not quite ready yet. Um, and I'm watching this market emerging. I'm watching the momentum building. My mind is being blown that this thing that I never thought had any possibility of happening is now happening. So fast forward to the summer of 2014. Um, I'd actually just come back from an extraordinary trip to Brazil for the World Cup. And I'd gotten back to Washington in time to watch the World Cup final. And I'm trying to decide where I'm going to go and watch this, this game. Um, and for some reason, I felt compelled to go to this restaurant that is not a place you would ordinarily go to watch a World Cup match. There's a lot of great soccer bars that you could have gone, but for some reason, it felt like the right place to go in uh, and watch this, this, this um, game. And so I'm sitting at the bar, sipping a cup of coffee, watching um, the, the match on the screen above the bar. And I get introduced to the woman who is sitting next to me. And as you do in Washington, I ask what she does, and she tells me she's about to start a data analytics company in the cannabis industry. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I met our founder, Giada Guaya de Carcer. And it's been nearly six years since we met. Yeah. And um, we hit it off immediately. We spent yeah. a handful of hours that day geeking out at the bar. And she's like, where have you come from? Everybody else in Washington, at the time you were talking about cannabis, people would you know, run for the hills screaming. Um, but there was just a clear connection there that was almost immediate, that was immediate. Um, and as the conversation continued, as I began to understand what it was she was doing, it became clear that this was just too compelling an opportunity to pass on. A total greenfield market um, mm. that was growing explosively, that had no data, no meaningful data worth speaking about, and that was so well aligned with my professional interests. Yeah. So I officially joined New Frontier in January 2015, and had never looked back. What an interesting trajectory. Were you also born in Kenya? I was born and raised in Kenya. Yeah. Uh, moved to the US. Uh, How old were you? I was 12 and a half when we moved to the US. Yeah. So did middle school and high school here. Uh, and then I went to the UK for my undergrad and graduate degrees. Yeah. Um, moved back to Washington, and it's largely called called at home since. And doing data for all these other massive companies uh, and analytics. Uh, and now you saw the trend. Uh, and it's so interesting how the universe put you and uh, New Frontier Data at this like World Cup final, like you were going somewhere that wasn't unconventional and it ended up happening. It's very interesting. So, okay, now, uh, how do you guys pick? You know, in 2014, these things are you know, starting up. You're trying to f you know, find signal in data is just something, uh, even in your previous uh, work that you were doing as an analyst, how are you, how do you find signal in data? Like structuring data is something that we care a lot about. Right. That's what we're right. doing. We're identifying great minds. We're sitting down with them, structuring data, sharing it with other people in a mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. But how do you pick? Like how do we pick who to pick? How do you, mm -hmm. how do you pick the data which most interesting to you guys? So this is where there's a science and an art to um, the kind of work that we do. Um, one of the things that I learned quite early in my career and, and had extraordinary mentors to, to um, guide us through our, our early training was that it's very easy to teach the mechanics of research. It's very easy, relatively, to teach people how to crunch the numbers. And particularly now in this highly technological environment, uh, there's no shortage of solutions that can do the vast majority of the work for you in terms of just processing uh, data. What is much more difficult to do is um, to explain, to understand and identify the so what, to understand and identify the implications mm. and tell a compelling story around it. Mm. And, and that's the art of research. That's the art of what we do. Um, why should people care? Why should people care? Um, and how can they use this to do what they do better? Mm -hmm. um, in a case like cannabis, having come from an environment where you know, our issue was actually generally we had too much data, you know? <laughs> we had too much information. Coming to cannabis, there was, it was not just the most data dearth environment I'd ever been in, it was the most data averse environment I've ever been in. Um, one of the first conversations I had with a master grower, um, he told me that he's been growing cannabis for about 30 years in Northern California. 
but at the end of every cultivation cycle, he'll burn all of his notes, all of his records, because he was so scared about federal intervention, about getting uh, uh, caught up by law enforcement, that he didn't want any records of his historical practices. So, you know, coming from an environment where we're literally talking about billions of data points into one where yeah. uh, people are writing things down on uh, in notebooks and then burning, burning them at the yeah. end yeah. of the season was just a, a complete <laughs> flip of the yeah. kind of environment we're in. So as a company, we realized that uh, this was not going to be a conventional environment in ter terms of the types of data stories that you see in other yeah. um, ecosystems. But that also where we saw an opportunity. Yeah. And rather than focusing on any singular part of the industry, not, you know, rather than focusing, say, on retail or on consumers or on investment trends, we cast the nets completely wide to capture any data we could from any source. Um, feed it into our system and start using that to identify where both the connective tissue was within these data sets mm -hmm. as well as what the broader story we were seeing emerging was. And what were those connecting tissues and what is the broader story that emerged? So one is that for every market we have seen legalized, we have seen explosive consumer demand. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been in the space for five years, over five years now and when I first started, I thought I knew how much cannabis Americans consumed. I had no idea. Um, Americans have a prodigious appetite for cannabis. And you know, one, of the, one of the interesting things about this how market. Much, how much are we talking? <laughs> so uh, some numbers just on a global context. We've just done uh, what we believe to be the most comprehensive assessment of global demand for cannabis in the world today. Um, there are over 260 million, at least semi-regular cannabis consumers around the world who are collectively spending over $350 billion each year on cannabis. So if the current legal market is just around over $20 billion, we have barely scratched the tip of the iceberg of the addressable market that can, the, the full legalization will represent, assuming it became legal globally. And it's a, a trillion dollar market or more, yeah. It, it, it certainly has that potential because um, if we're talking about a $350 billion market of just regular consumption, yeah. which is largely flour um, and generally low quality flour uh, in most parts of the world, that does not include um, all of the medical applications and, yeah. and the, the emerging kind of therapeutic uses, um, nor does it include any of the industrial applications that are emerging with activation of legal industrial hemp. So the, the long-term opportunity that this could, could grow into uh, uh, has meant that as my study of the industry has continued, um, I believe that the legalization of cannabis is going to be um, arguably the most consequential social change of our, of our generation. Yeah. So it could be that the um, industrial hemp and also the um, health and wellness applications of cannabis uh, could themselves be significantly larger than the recreational use uh, market? On the legal side, absolutely, at least initially. Yeah. Um, so first taking the medicinal side, um, it has been extraordinary to see how quickly the global community has began to have this debate, conversation around medical cannabis. When we first started looking at this industry, you know, there were probably four countries around the world where there was meaningful progress or, or active um, legal programs. We're now looking at over 60 countries, um, just in a five-year window. Um, so the pace is accelerating dramatically, and the reason why it's moving so quickly is because yeah. the science is affirming it. Yeah. When the World Health Organization comes out with a statement, with a very affirmative statement about the uh, wellness and therapeutic benefits of CBD, when um, the, the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, uh, through the most comprehensive assessment of all of the scientific literature around cannabis, comes out and says, yes, it does work for uh, pain for nausea related to, to cancers. It does um, improve patient wellness outcomes. Um, you know, the, the medical community, which has so long been informed by the propaganda of the war on drugs and, and uh, of prohibition, um, is now being challenged to rethink um, the, the role that cannabis can play in improving health and wellness outcomes in our population. And so that's happening on a global basis. and and. Um, even amongst skeptics, when 
they see the effects that it is having on their friends and their loved ones. Um, like so many other issues, once it hits home, once it becomes a kitchen table issue, yeah. um, attitudes change very, very quickly. Once a family member has some sort of a health Absolutely. issue and then it Absolutely. Solved, yeah, like changes yeah. perspectives, yeah. yeah. Um, on the industrial side, we think the, the transition is going to be a little bit different. So because cannabis and, uh, or because marijuana and hemp got prohibited at about the same time, um, despite the long-standing recognition that hemp was a pr phenomenally versatile plant, um, uh, it, it largely got removed from our industrial economy. So for all of the innovations that have happened across the industrial economy, or across virtually every other sector of the economy uh, over the past decade, um, hemp has remained a largely unexplored, unstudied plant. And so the, the applications that we're seeing people starting to focus on now, whether it's bioplastics and companies like BMW um, integrating hemp-based plastics into the interiors of their latest models, um, biofuels, the hemp producers equivalent of light, sweet, crude for, um, um, uh, 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 for uh, bioethanol, biodiesel. Um, textiles, uh, the fact that Levi's have just announced their first um, hemp cotton blend jeans. Mm. And even though it is a 70-30 cotton hemp, um, we anticipate within a few years it's, it's a matter of time before we start seeing 100% uh, hemp products that are virtually indistinguishable mm. um, from, um, from uh, cotton. Um, everything from uh, paper to uh, animal feed. The spectrum of applications that, the construction materials. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> super capacitors. With hemp? With hemp. So there's a team out of Canada about two years ago that did this study that found when you carbonize hemp, um, it produces a super capacitor that can rival graphene. And graphene right now is, is yeah. one of the best uh, applications that we've, we've identified. Um, it, it produces a super capacitor that can rival hemp with none of the toxicity, um, uh, sorry, a supercapacitor that can rival graphene with none of the toxicity that, that um, is related to the manufacturing of graphene. Now, this is early science still, but consider the possibility that you know, uh, the Teslas of the future could be running on batteries that are based on hemp-based carbon. Uh, these are applications that we're just beginning to explore. Um, and as you see increased investment, as more countries begin to reintroduce hemp into their economies, uh, the pace of that innovation is going to accelerate dramatically. Mm -hmm. And the substitution of hemp for many existing applications, I think, will grow um, across the economy. Ooh, man, you really showcase this as uh, the emerging market. Just, yeah, just straight up the emerging market. Like, the other people argue that, oh, you know, blockchain, crypto, decentralization is like the emerging market, but you're like, no, 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 like, and they kind of go, they go hand in hand Certainly. in so many ways. But, yeah. and, and this is not to, to knock either blockchain or crypto, which are going to be massively disruptive in their respective ways. Yeah. Um, but I think w there's a number of things that make hemp unique in where it sits in, in the economy, or where cannabis sits in the economy. One is just how disruptive it will be in so many different aspects of our society. So um, let's just take some social um, uh, issues as, as easy considerations. Uh, prohibition enforcement has been largely very inequitable. You know, in, in the US, you are large, uh, across the country on average four times more likely to be arrested for uh, cannabis offenses if you were black than if you were white. Um, in Washington DC, you were eight times more likely to be arrested if you were black than white. Um, in fact, we just had an event with the mayor of DC last week and uh, we ran some numbers that found black males make up 22% of uh, Washington's population, but make up over 80% of the arrests for marijuana offenses. There's been significant, very significant inequity in the way prohibition has been enforced. So with legalization, the ability to uh, remediate what has been a century of inequity um, uh, alone is going to be a dramatic social impact. Because of prohibition, cannabis consumers have been driven underground. It has not, you know, 10% of Americans, or just about 10% of Americans consume cannabis regularly. So it has not, prohibition has not stopped their use. It has just meant that it has become a very segregated, you know, isolated activity. 
Um, the fact that we're now talking about cannabis social use spaces appearing in mm -hmm. um, on Main Street. Uh, a company called Lowell's just opened the Los Angeles' first cannabis cafe. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be radically disruptive to our kind of notions of where cannabis sits in our society. Yeah. The medical applications, we're in the midst of a catastrophic opioid epidemic. Yeah. When states like Illinois say that um, now when your doctor or when your physician issues you an opioid prescription, you automatically become eligible to participate in the medical cannabis program because they're so worried about pro uh, yeah. uh, propagating this opioid epidemic. You know, these are just kind of low-hanging fruit in terms of some of the ways cannabis is, is um, reshaping some long-standing uh, uh, aspects of, uh, of our society. Like physicians literally being educated on their MCAT about cannabis and the endocannabinoid system. Yeah, that'd be... And the fact that they're not being, and they haven't been uh, hi historically. The doctors who were at the vanguard of, of medical cannabis had to go and study this themselves because it wasn't being taught in, in medical school. Um, and so the, all of those applications, the, the, all, all of those implications from uh, policing and uh, social governance to um, uh, destigmatization and the normalization of cannabis in our society um, are, are going to be tr really consequential in, in the way we think about where cannabis sits in our society. Pulling on that thread a bit more, something like social use cafes where cannabis is served but alcohol is not allowed. Oh, it's just like straight up also just, yeah, just ban that other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nope, can't bring your beer in, no wine in here. There was an extraordinary paper in the British Medical Journal, The Lancet, um, a little while ago that showed it was the largest global study on the impact of alcohol uh, on global public health. Yeah. And in the conclusion of that report, there's a statement that read, the only safe amount of alcohol to consume is none. Now, even the lead author would go on to say, he is going to have a glass of wine with his, sure. with his dinner. Sure. But you know, there's a real kind of recognition that alcohol has had a hugely deleterious effect on public health around the world. Yeah. And now you have a, class, a, a, a cohort of young adults who are growing, coming into maturity at a time when cannabis is largely or increasingly being seen as as acceptable, if not better than alcohol. The disruptive impact that this could have on alcohol and alcohol's place in our society um, is potentially going to be very, very significant, and that's part of the reason why companies like Constellation Brands, one of the world's largest cannabis com uh, alcohol companies, uh, just spent $4 billion investing in a Canadian licensed operator. They, they see the writing on the wall. Yeah. And so when you take all of that and then add on things like the industrial applications of hemp, um, the, uh, in my view, the implications of cannabis as an industry, I think, extend well beyond um, what something like blockchain or, or crypto could do. Damn, such a good synthesis on the industry. Like, I'm, I'm loving it. It's obvious that New Frontier has to do a lot of uh, deep dives into all of the different um, profound impacts that the, the, the ascension of uh, cannabis and hemp will have on uh, our world. And, uh, and by doing so, you guys also become, uh, you know, doing these industry analyses gives you guys unique uh, foresight and so then companies want to talk to you and they want to know well where should we uh, invest uh, what countries are uh, moving forward what are they moving forward with which specific aspects are they going forward with how are Gen Z uh, gonna be uh, stepping into their you know as 10 year olds seeing cannabis be uh, legal and also then as 20 year olds when they have the option to consume, well, what are they going to be choosing? How are we going to be leveraging it for other spiritual ascension mm -hmm. potentials? And um, right now it doesn't really seem like alcohol is being used for that mm -hmm. whatsoever. So there's so much fascinating nuance there. Do you guys end up taking the, uh, the teach us about this process. Do you guys end up taking and making uh, uh, industry reports and then taking those reports and then distributing them through uh, people that subscribe to New Frontier Data? Right, so, so we have a number of approaches by which we do our work. Um, because of the broad spectrum of issues across the industry that we're tracking, of data that we're ingesting from companies in the industry, from governments at the 
county, state, national level, international organizations. Uh, uh, because of some of the partnerships we've built. We, we have this constant and extraordinary stream of data that's flowing across our um, um, data engines. So we use the public-facing reports that we, we release as a way to signal to the market some of the major issues that we're thinking about. Um, you know, the, the, um, given how much is happening in cannabis, we feel that one of the privileges our, our role has uh, given us is the ability to see what's happening next, what's coming next. And for the stakeholders who are either already in the space and kind of heads down in the work, or trying to come into the space and trying to figure out where they should fit, um, our, work gives, our reports give them a chance to understand where some of the major issues that they should be paying attention to um, lie within this space. But there's a second uh, aspect to our work, which is the custom research that we do. So there's a lot of companies who will see something that we've talked about in a report and then engage us to do some specific analysis for them, uh, some specific research on a critical issue that they're facing. We work with a lot of investors who are trying to understand, you know, I, I see this opportunity. Is this, say, category going to be as lucrative as this in company that we're about to invest in claims it's going to be? Um, what is the long-term trajectory of, uh, of this market? I'll give you an example. We just completed a project with um, a group of Australian investors who have phenomenal experience in the agricultural sector but have never been in cannabis before. They were looking at an uh, investment, a fairly substantial investment, in a company that makes cannabis nutrients. And the question was, how big is this market going to be and what sort of potential capture opportunity could this company um, take of, of that market? We did all of that analysis and that ultimately involved the investment thesis and ultimately the investment decision. Um, We've worked with you know, companies who are looking at some of these emerging state markets. You know, a state like Florida is about to go adult, is about to have an adult use uh, ballot initiative pro um, proposed for 2020. Um, for the investors who are looking at a large market that has a very likely, strong likelihood of passing, um, early tests uh, suggest that, that uh, if a ballot were introduced today that there's a good likelihood it could pass. Um, investors are looking at that market and it's going to be a lucrative one and they're wondering, you know, how, how large is opportunity specifically going to be um, and what are some of the key dynamics we should be looking out for as we try to navigate that investment. Um, similarly on a global scale, I mean, we've seen this explosion in interest in CBD um, and com companies are now wondering, you know, how does the global CBD supply chain work? How do we get involved? Where should we be? If we have the ability to set up operations anywhere in the world, which countries should we be looking at? Um, and what sort of assets should we be investing in to ensure that we're not planning for next year, we're planning five years from now, for a market five years from now? Well, so there's a, there's a lot of uh, yeah, public-facing uh, reports going out, but then there's also all these uh, incoming uh, uh, inquiries. They're, they're, they're really, they're querying your knowledge uh, chief knowledge officer, <laughs> like they're, they're querying your knowledge so that they can gain the insights and so then you work with companies, organizations individually as well based on what they want to know. That's right. So the, the data that we make available through Equia, which is our, our data platform, and um, maybe the, the simple way to think about it is like Bloomberg for the cannabis industry. Mm -hmm. um, it uh, houses the, not just the reports that we produce, but the data underlying the report. So if you want to go in and uh, um, kind of explore the data yourself, you can certainly do that. Um, and so there's ability to kind of go through the self-service model of you know, just taking the content that's relevant to you and uh, um, kind of diving into our content stream and capitalizing on that. Um, and then for the, for the stakeholders who are now grappling with a very specific issue to engage us um, to do um, a much more customized and nuanced analysis for, for them. You mentioned this earlier that you guys have so much data that is coming in. I mean, we could talk about that, but you actually said that that's not as challenging now as actually talking about the stories of the why that data matters after it does get structured. Mm -hmm. And so uh, tell us about how you guys can take up like a Pixar or like a Disney role regarding storytelling about the profundity of the data and why it should matter to the world? That's, that's a great question and, and a really important one based on where we are right now as a cannabis industry. 
Um, and, I'll, and I'll use the example of the cannabis consumer, which is where we think one of the greatest opportunities for cannabis is beginning to emerge. So pre-legalization, the cannabis consumer was a monolith. You were either a cannabis consumer or you weren't. Post-legalization, we bifurcated the cannabis consumers into either a medical consumer or a recreational consumer. Um, but as we were looking at the space, to me, that just didn't feel right. From all of the consumers we were speaking to, that, that duality, that, that simple duality, just was not reflective of the nuanced ways in which consumers were, were um, interfacing and integrating cannabis into their, their lives and lifestyles. So in uh, late 2018, we deployed what at the time was the largest cannabis consumer survey that had ever been done. Um, nationally, uh, which was based in the US, nationally, um, uh, national scope, uh, including recreate, like fully recreational medical and unregulated markets. And the question was, we're trying to understand who is the cannabis consumer? Based on this very, very large survey, I mean, it took our respondents nearly 30 minutes to complete. So we, we spent a lot of time not just asking about their cannabis usage habits, their cannabis experiences, but other things about their lives and lifestyles. Um, um, you know, and what was the sample size of this massive um, survey? 4,500. 4,500? 4, yeah. Wow, across so, the US. Across the US. Okay. So by statistical pur uh, for statistical purposes, more than enough data for us to do some really, really elegant segmentation. 30 minutes is a big survey too. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So we took... Actually, the questions, as an interviewer, I already know that you guys focusing on the questions was, again, the m one of the most important parts of all of this, because then it leads you to uh, what the answers are, what the data is that you get. So I assume you guys exactly. spent a ridiculous amount of time on the questions. It yeah. was a month long, like m many months long effort to, to build that survey right, um, because we knew that if we got it right, the, the applications for that data downstream would be potentially profound. Yeah, let's hear it. Yeah. So um, once we got the data back, it became clear that you know, this idea of the medical recreational uh, binary was just completely incorrect. Um, and there was, it was much more of a fluid continuum between uh, kind of pure recreational consumers blending into the wellness consumer yeah. and then to the pure pharmaceutical app user, consumer who's treating cannabis like any other pharmaceutical drug. Interesting, recreational blending with wellness, blending with uh, augment, augment uh, replacement in a sense, uh, pharmaceutical. Uh, and just to totally spectrum style between like that yeah. style of, okay, very cool. But, but okay. there was a layer deeper than that, yes. which is we took nearly 200 data points out of that um, survey uh, and used it to create consumer clusters. So we basically said, take these 200 data points and let the algorithm identify the groups that have the greatest affinity within them. And through that, we developed nine cannabis consumer archetypes, profiles of cannabis consumers that are not just defined based on what they consume and how they consume, but based on all of these other lifestyle attributes as well that inform their usage habits and inform their attitudes. And cannabis consumer archetypes. Precisely. Wow. Um, and the archetypes fell across, it was nine archetypes, three that fell across the highest using groups, three that fell across the moderate using groups, three that fell across the, the um, lowest using groups. Um, but as we explained these archetypes, and, and I'll perhaps give you a couple of examples. We had the traditional lifestylers, people who use cannabis very, very regularly, but are much more likely to be flower-only smokers. So these are people who have integrated cannabis into virtually everything. They use it to get up and go. They use it to wind down at the end of the day. Um, uh, you know, they are uh, kind of, let's call them joint a day consumers, so kind of uh, daily habitual consumers. Uh, but they are almost flower only, flower exclusive consumers. So they're much less likely to consume any types of products. Mm -hmm. Contrast that against the modern lifestylers who have a very similar usage profile but have completely embraced the new value-added products. So these are consumers. They're like Tic Tac, the one, two milligram Tic Tac. Absolutely. Of yeah. So they're you know, not just using vapes and edibles and tinctures and uh, words. They still consume flour, but much more load balanced on these other types of products. 
And because they're using these other types of products, they're also much more likely to use these products in much more diversified ways. It's like the artisanal user of the... Yeah. <laughs> they're like, which uh, uh, brand of this do you uh, purchase of the cannabis? Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and it's, it's, it's and the, the idea that maybe in the morning I'll use a, a yeah. CBD vape for one thing, and then if I go to the gym in the afternoon, I'll use a, a, oh, yeah, a, yeah. Sat, a, a kind of activating sativa. Um, after I'm done working out, I'll uh, apply a CBD lotion on my sore muscles. Uh, and then before I go to bed, I'll have a, wow. um, an indica to help me sleep and help me stay asleep longer. Um, and so it, it's extraordinary what the advent of these new product forms has done for the way um, cannabis is being used. Not just because they allow for a lot more discretion. You, know, you can't smoke a joint in a restaurant or a bar without mm -hmm. being quickly escorted out, mm -hmm. or even at a dinner party without mm -hmm. people freaking out. Uh, but, you know, today... You can pop you a little tic-tac at the you, party. That's right. Yeah, you yeah. could take a little edible, or you could pull out a vape pen, which, you know, some vapes have, uh, are so odorless now that literally a person yeah. next to you could be consuming and you wouldn't be able to tell. Tell, yeah. Um, well, these archetypes are so interesting. And then there's the ones like um, we interviewed uh, Kristen Price and Sarah mm -hmm. Baker as well, who are literally going through some of the most rare uh, diseases mm -hmm. um, as, as literally teenagers. Yeah. And then for them to be able to take, you know, like hundreds of milligrams of um, full spectrum hemp CBD right. to heal uh, themselves right. and to start company as like, so there's like that yeah. too for this that, that was one of our archetypes, the medical yeah. purists. Um, consumers who truly are using cannabis as a pharmaceutical product and, and um, you know, there, there was nothing social recreational about their use. Um, a very, very regimented, uh, uh, meticulous about, you know, this is just a medicinal product. Um, and so trying to pitch them a product for going out to hang out with their friends would just have no resonance with them. I have a, a quick question on the way out. Um, the last one, actually. Um, the last question is, uh, the emerging market is exploding. Uh, how do we make sure that the fruits of this emerging market, unlike past instances of emerging markets, how do these fruits become more well democratized and distributed across uh, minority populations, across um, vulnerable populations, uh, women, people of color, all this type of stuff? Just, just democratize the financial benefits more widely. How, how can we ensure something like that? This is a great and critical question um, because the window to do that is actually closing and it's closing quickly. First, there has to be a candid conversation about um, some of the things I mentioned earlier, the inequity that cannabis prohibition uh, has had on the state of the market today, uh, on who's participating in the market and who feels that they can participate in the market today. There's a lot of people who, you know, after being um, or recognizing that any association with cannabis could get them into deep, deep trouble and that they would be targeted for it. Getting those people to switch their mindset uh, to now say that they're going to enter the industry it t it takes work, it takes real conversation for them to understand that this is a real legitimate opportunity and they're not going to face um, the, the, the challenges that they previously faced. The second thing that businesses in the space can do um, and should do is think deeply about um, how their practices are either supporting these broader goals, these broader goals around um, equity and opportunity in this space, yeah. or undermining them. So for example, one of the biggest challenges that uh, minorities of people of lower means have had participating in cannabis is access to capital. Um, the, the Black fact that cannabis is not banked at the federal level, you know, banks are not participating in this industry because of its illegality at the federal level, has meant that much of this industry has been largely privately funded. And so the people who have been able to, to participate most robustly are the people who have access to high net worth capital. Unfortunately, it has meant that there's been a, a great number of extraordinary entrepreneurs with gr brilliant ideas who, because of lack of access to capital, have not been able to bring those ideas to fruition. And so there needs to be um, uh, a robust conversation about how some of these uh, regulatory practices and the social environment that we're in are pro um, propagating and promulgating these, these issues. Um, 
issues like the advent of federal banking. Uh, there's a bill that just passed that for, that was going to that's intended to address this issue of banking for cannabis businesses should help um, um, more stakeholders find access to capital in the space. Um, but I think investors also need to challenge the conventional assumptions about who um, can be an opportunity, uh, a successful entrepreneur in this space. Uh, because the best, given that cannabis consumers represent the full cross section of society, um, it is one of the true egalitarian aspects uh, of products in our economy. Um, uh, it's important for both investors, business op op uh, operators to understand that um, because this is a product that transcends our society, uh, it should be a, an industry that reflects the spectrum of society. Yeah. Yeah. And we love asking at least this question at the end of the mm -hmm. show. What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Great question. A joyful spirit. And ironically, it's something, the profundity of which I, I hadn't understood until I came into the cannabis industry mm -hmm. and saw people who were more passionate, committed, driven, invested in their work than any other sector I've ever worked in. Um, I think it is a reason why, despite the phenomenal challenges this industry faces, I mean, you talk about a sector that has headwinds coming from all directions that it has been able to grow at the pace it has, that it has been able to achieve what it has, uh, because people love what they do. Um, and you know, at a time when, when they, there's so much doom and gloom, there's so much anxiety in, uh, in, in, in the public, I think um, we would all do well to find more joy uh, in ourselves and spark joy in each other. And I think that seems to be one of the motivate or driving commitments that's pushing a lot of people in this space. Yeah. John, this has been such a fascinating episode. Thank you so much for coming on and teaching us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Keep up the great work with New Friends here. It's so cool. Your macro perspective on the emergent market is so fascinating. Thank you. So Thank you. cool. So cool. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Check out the links in the bio to John. Also, check out the links to the work of New Frontier Data. Go check out all those links. Also, to New West Summit, check out those links. Support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations, the leaders in your communities and around the world. You can support us and our show. Our links are below. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. It's a wrap. Great job. Awesome. Great job. Awesome. That was so fun.